I have a dream that one day yes. this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yes. As a result of the kind of constitution that we have, it was wrong just out of pure logic for black people to be discriminated against solely on the basis of color. The 1964 and 65 Civil Rights Act uh, was clearly uh, something that needed to be done in order to, uh, to hold up the whole notion of justice in our country. Again, to paraphrase Dr. King, I may not get there with you, but someday we shall enter the promised land where men and women will not be judged by their sexual desires, but by the content of their character. Many fail to notice Mr. Kramer's substitution of the word sexual behavior for skin color as he misquoted the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the steps of the U.S. Capitol. Thus began the 1993 March on Washington for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender equal rights. The 1993 March on Washington for lesbian, gay, and bisexual equal rights and liberation comes 30 years after the 63 March that uh, Dr. King immortalized with his I Have a Dream speech. And for us, this is a continuation of that civil rights struggle. Now, homosexuals are using not only the language, but they are beginning to insist that the statutes, the laws, all of the advantages gained by civil rights leaders such as Martin Luther King be now uh, applied to homosexuals. We are an emerging, um, a, a, sort of the emerging, uh, latest great civil rights movement of the 90s. Gay rights now! Washington to Washington! Gay rights now! Currently, there is a movement in this country that threatens to undermine and belittle the entire civil rights effort of the 1960s. That homosexuals have equal rights under the First Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the state constitution of every state in which they reside. But the issue here today is special rights. It's special category of protection. They want to be elevated from a behavior-based lifestyle to a true minority status that would give them special rights. Once we get our rights, we want to have fun. It's an effort uh, by homosexuals and lesbians to promote uh, their lifestyle. They don't want uh, equal treatment. They want to be able to push their ideas, to get the acceptance of their lifestyle, and then to get special benefits as a result of it. This Civil Rights Act uh, amendment would completely neutralize the Civil Rights Act of 1964. What it will do is that it will say that anyone, anyone with any type of, of sexual preference, which would include everyone, is, is, would be protected under this law. So therefore there would be no protection for minorities specifically. Our community is at the verge of the bursting point. People are dying and they're prepared to do anything. Uh, very many people have nothing to lose. And, and if the government does not respond in a positive way, I predict that you're going to see massive disruption in this society. According to the U.S. Supreme Court, any person seeking protected minority class status must satisfy three elements. Immutable characteristics like race and gender, financial discrimination, and political weakness. The group must be clearly identified by unchangeable physical characteristics such as skin color or gender that defines them as an insular and discrete group. 
As a white male, I have no rights whatsoever other than what is shared with everybody else. Uh, we have granted certain rights to take care of past discrimination, uh, invidious discrimination based on such things as race uh, or on gender. Uh, but it seems to me that, again, these are benign characteristics having nothing to do with behavior. Minorities have come in and, and said, we resent the homosexual community comparing uh, the skin color and that kind of lifestyle. The skin color is not something we could control, but homosexuality is a preference. It is something that can be dealt with, can be controlled. Homosexuality is a lifestyle, and the Hispanic community is an ethnic group. The Hispanic community does not want to be compared with homosexuals. Government has no business putting a stamp of approval on a behavior-based group, let alone elevate it to full minority status. The high-handed attempt on the part of gay and lesbian movements to hijack the 1964 Civil Rights Act in order to try to give national credence to their moral lifestyle is an offense to black America. There are few people willing to stand up and rebut this whole notion that there is any kind of comparison to the, um, to the sexuality of homosexuals and the, the skin tone of black people. It is a horrendous lie. Black people are not born choosing to be black. But homosexuals, on the other hand, despite what all of them seem to want to indicate to us, choose their homosexual lifestyles. The group must have suffered a history of discrimination resulting in the lack of ability to earn an average mean income, obtain an adequate education, or enjoy cultural opportunities. Compare these results of a nationwide survey reported in the Wall Street Journal between homosexuals and African Americans regarding average household incomes, percentage of college graduates, percentage of those holding professional managerial positions, percentage of those who have taken overseas vacations. Have either African Americans or homosexuals ever been denied the right to vote? Ever faced legal segregation? Ever denied access by law to public drinking fountains and restrooms? Ever denied by law access to businesses and restaurants? Their high income, their education, their, their current status in society compared to the, the mean or the median income in, in minority families today, I mean, it's just, there's no comparison. So for them to want protection under this law and to try to further uh, beat down the minorities and further lessen their chances of equal protection and equal chances at jobs, I just think is ludicrous. If you look across America, homosexuals are not in conclaves as homeless people under bridges and in food lines waiting for things. These are high-income people who want to push their agenda. I think that it really uh, flaunts and makes a mockery of other legitimate uh, civil rights uh, that people have worked for for years. And to, to give this kind of recognition uh, is going to undermine all kinds of laws that are already on the books, and, and it's going to hurt a lot of people that deserve these protections. The group must demonstrate that they are politically powerless. In the 1992 elections, the homosexual community claimed to have donated $3.4 million to Clinton's campaign and supplied many other campaigns with volunteers and contributions, making them one of the most financially powerful political forces today. Their political power was further evidenced by the appointment of militant lesbian activist Roberta Actenberg as the nation's top fair housing official. The homosexual um, lobbyists, the homosexual groups in this country are well-funded, well-connected to, to powerful politicians. Well, we're a powerful voting force now. I think that uh, we have a pretty solid role in the Democratic Party. We have friends in Congress. We have more support on Congress than, than non-supporters. There are many people that come out repeatedly uh, in the D.C. city government. We, all of the city council members have come out repeatedly in favor of gay rights. Homosexuality is defined as a behavior by the act of sex with members of the same sex. It does not qualify for minority status classification because behavior or conduct is irrelevant. As recently as 1986, the U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Berger ruled in Bowers v. Hartwick that, in constitutional terms, there is no such thing as a fundamental right to commit homosexual sodomy. Elevated civil rights status 
uh, should not be granted to homosexuals uh, any more than it's granted to uh, any other group in our society where there has uh, been no uh, real reason for granting that status. And particularly in an area where a large percentage of the population uh, regards such conduct uh, to be immoral. No one should have special rights or privileges or minority status because of their sexual behavior. We don't have it for people who are polygamous. We don't have it for people who have affairs on their wives or husbands. The idea that the Founding Fathers or the, our Constitution somehow ensh enshrines within it uh, civil rights or special human rights for interest groups or for behavior groups, homosexuals, uh, whatever kind of, of behavior group you want to come up with. That is, that's totally false, totally contrary to the understanding of the fathers. Our intent is to see that, that uh, everyone is treated fair and equal, and they are being treated equal under the law as a citizen of America. Right. But their behavior should not dictate special preference for them. This is a matter of good law versus bad law. And it is bad law to codify into public policy a special right and a special protection based on nothing other than what you do in the privacy of your own bedroom. Four basic myths have been advanced by militant homosexual leaders over the years. These myths have become the foundation on which the gay political platform has been built. The already mentioned myth that homosexuality meets the qualifications of a minority, that 10% of the population is homosexual, that homosexuality is genetic, hormonal, or biological, and as a result, homosexuals cannot change and become heterosexual. The 10% figure taken from Alfred Kinsey's infamous sex study included prisoners, sex offenders, and child molesters as participants. Dr. Paul Gephardt, a partner in the Kinsey study, has admitted that the 10% figure was incorrect. All recent national studies place the homosexual population at around 1%. Confronted with these facts, gay leaders are only now admitting that the inflated percentage was used for political purposes. The thing about the 1 in 10, I think people probably always did know that it was inflated, but it was a nice number that you could point to, that you could say 1 in 10, and it's a really good way to get people to visualize that we're here. There are people who believe that they are born homosexual. Uh, they have been taught that, and having been taught that, they accept that. And of course, if that's true, then there's no way that change could ever take place. But that's simply not true. Scientific studies have shown that uh, genes are not the problem. Now, some people will say, well, they're born this way. There is no evidence, there is no conclusive evidence that homosexuality is predetermined. You're not born with it. It is, it is something that you adapt yourself to. It's something that you choose. Well, I think uh, one makes a choice to be gay. I'm not sure that there is enough research to prove whether or not a person is born with genetic proclivities toward being gay. As a person with a psychological background, I know for me it was a choice that I made around 30 and there were times when I was real ambivalent about it. It's a real hard choice to make because it's an unpopular one. It seems to me that the whole gay and lesbian news is about choice. It was about choice to begin with. The people get the right to choose who they love. Can someone who has had a homosexual struggle see a change in his life leading to complete heterosexuality? The answer is yes. What I do is something called reparative therapy. It's not only possible to, to diminish the behavior, but it's possible to diminish the intensity of the homosexual attraction and to increase heterosexual feelings. I know they can change. I was a practicing homosexual for 17 years, and I've been free of that for 13. I've been out of the gay life now for eight years. God has healed me of my homosexual attractions. God has healed me of that need for um, a heavy emotional bond, overtly emotional bond with other men. Don't get sucked into the gay agenda. Don't get sucked into the unquestioned assumption that now you have no other choice but to join the gay community. Nonsense. 300,000 attended the extravagant March on Washington. Organizers resorted to full-page advertisements in gay publications to lure as many sympathizers as possible to the nation's capital.
hundreds of thousands of gays, lesbians, bisexuals, sadomasochists, and transgenders were attracted by the promise of a wild, three-day sexually indulgent celebration. The purpose of the 1993 March on Washington, which was funded in part by the Presidential Inauguration Committee, was to publicize the wide-ranging platform homosexuals were demanding that Congress enact. There were seven broad demands, encompassing 55 sub-demands for gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgenders. Demand number one repeals all sodomy laws and legalizes any and all forms of sexual expression. Age of consent laws would be changed to allow sex with youth, and dress code laws would be repealed allowing all forms of dress or non-dress. We want an end to the sodomy laws in this country because they have nothing to do with life or living. I feel that they need to change the sodomy laws. This is what we're striving for, to change sodomy laws, to be able to, be, to, to show our sexuality in public. It's wrong uh, that we have laws in America that criminalize sexual behavior, things like the age of consent law and uh, sodomy repeal, and we're going to see that those laws will fall. Lowering the age limit may May, may educate people and, and help people become more comfortable with themselves and allow them to grow. Demand number two diverts massive funds from the defense budget to cover AIDS patients' medical expenses. It calls for taxpayers to fund cosmetic sex change operations for transgenders and supply needles to IV drug addicts. Demand number three legalizes marriages between members of the same sex. Legal adoption, Custody and foster care would also be allowed within these new homosexual family structures. We have uh, marriages just as other people have marriages, and we want to have the same kind of benefits from the federal government. Demand number four requires full inclusion of lesbians, gays, bisexuals, and transgenders in education, child care, and school counseling programs. Demand number five requires that contraceptives and unrestricted abortion services be made available to all people, regardless of age. Demand number six provides taxpayer funding for artificial insemination of lesbians and bisexuals and forbids religious-based concerns about homosexuality from being expressed. Demand number seven requires organizations such as the Boy Scouts of America to accept homosexual scoutmasters. When you talk about the strides that have been made in, in the gay and lesbian community, I mean, it's uh, good news and bad news. I mean, what's ironic is that this terrible, awful disease, which has taken so many of our, our friends and lovers away from us, has been the same thing that has gelled us together as a community. And I think it's ironic because it's really because of this disease that we've all gathered much more political strength. We've had over a hundred co-sponsors of the federal lesbian and gay civil rights bill the last session of Congress, so we have a lot of people that I think we can consider our friends. Um, Kennedy is one of the main uh, forefront people as far as pushing that bill through. We have certainly increased the number of our friends in Congress. We've got more energy, more resources, more people with a, with a, a much higher level of, of optimism. We've got to keep moving people into office on every level. We cannot step back for a minute. We've got to, to keep our constituents not for a minute believing that now is the time to lay back. Now is not the time to lay back. We've got to move our agenda while we've got a window of opportunity. We've had some big legislative successes over the last few years, including the passage of the Hate Crime Statistics Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we believe it's time to pass a federal lesbian and gay civil rights bill. Uh, we all know we're going to see an executive order, uh, see a civil rights bill in the very near future. We're here to demonstrate that the queer community in the United States is united and we're going to do everything that we can in order to make sure that we get the legislative power that we deserve. The government does not respond. We are going to make the government respond. If they keep f***ing with us, then maybe we're going to have to start throwing bombs to make them stop. We're young! We're queer! We're gonna rule the world! We're young! We're queer! We're gonna rule the world! These guys are on the move. They're not only stay, staying with the military and the Supreme Court and the, and the House and the Senate, but they're coming into the states and they're trying to, to, to put in laws at the city level, at the community level, at the county level, at the state level. And make no mistake about it, we will not stop until we have achieved our freedom, our justice, and our...
our pursuit of happiness. For the first time in American history, a gay and lesbian inaugural ball was held in honor of the president's election. Throughout the program, Bill Clinton, via videotape, thanked the gay community for its support and financial contribution. In return, the gay community cheered Bill Clinton as the president they put into office. I just want to thank the gay and lesbian community for your courage and your commitment. I have a vision and you're a part of it. The election of Bill Clinton was the single most significant event in the struggle for lesbian and gay civil rights. We believe in the new administration and, and we, want, we want to support it. We cannot stay home and let this go on without us. It's our government now. It's our government now. What you see behind you is a plan for Mr. Clinton because all of what you see here, Bill Clinton through his executive offices, appointments, and uh, administrative uh, departments can do himself without Congress. Although, of course, Congress has got to come up behind and also push. We have a whole other agenda for the 103rd Legislative Congress. Clinton is a friend of ours, and he's going to take care of all gay and lesbians rights. And he's going to shake up the country. We're watching you, Bill. We're keeping our eyes on you. We're keeping our big, queer eyes on you. Mm. <laughs> And Al, too. And Al, too. We like Al. He's cute. <laughs> Many of those involved in churches, schools, and businesses are concerned about the ramifications should homosexuals be granted minority status. Well, if uh, Congress should uh, have the misfortune uh, to include homosexuals uh, within the 1964 Civil Rights Act as a specially protected class, I think it would have a very disastrous effect on our society. It would mean that people uh, against their own religious principles uh, would perhaps have to uh, hire such people. You're going to see um, government using the force of law to say to you in your business, you're going to have to hire this person because he is a homosexual. If you have uh, in some small town in Mississippi a person that comes in is homosexual and says, uh, I want a job, and for uh, whatever reason you don't hire that person, you run the risk of being sued and put out of business. It is a mistake uh, for lots of reasons, including the additional burden on small business men and women. A special privileges for homosexuals would allow one more reason to file a lawsuit, uh, one more way uh, that a small business could find itself uh, blackmailed politically. Or, or economically. The links to which they will go and the legal problems this will, would cause if we dare to put it into the Civil Rights Act are unimaginable at this point. Gay activists have wasted no time in pushing their agenda into schools across America. Under the guise of AIDS education and multiculturalism, homosexuals are promoting their lifestyle to children beginning in preschool and kindergarten. Books such as Heather Has Two Mommies and Daddy's Roommate are currently being used in many private and public schools and libraries without the knowledge of parents. In addition, the playbook for kids about sex is being made available to elementary school children and gives specific instructions on various methods of masturbation. Michael Swift writes in Gay Community News, We shall sodomize your sons, emblems of your feeble masculinity, we shall seduce them in your schools, in your dormitories, in your gymnasiums, in your locker rooms, in your sports arenas, in your seminaries, in your youth groups. Project 10, named after the myth that one person in 10 is homosexual, was spawned in 1984 in Los Angeles, California. Its goal, according to its lesbian founder, school teacher Virginia Uribe, was to persuade school children, beginning in kindergarten, to accept homosexual behavior as normal and desirable. For her efforts, Uribe was given the Award for Creative Leadership in Human Rights by the National Education Association. The, the state courts must be used to force the school districts to disseminate accurate information about homosexuality. I mean, they need to hear, the kids need to hear this. They need to hear the latest scientific information on the subject of homosexuality, and that's something that all kids need to hear, not just gay and lesbian kids.
starting from kindergarten, again, and working its way all the way through high school. This idea of talking about it one time in high school, well, we know that doesn't work. We need to start tackling this at the very early ages. We're an organization of gay and lesbian teachers working against homophobia in schools. One of the things that sex education does in the public schools is to tell the kids that there is no difference between homosexual lifestyle and heterosexual lifestyle. The aim of that is basically to break down any type of what they would call prejudice against the homosexual lifestyle. So basically what Americans have to understand is that the agenda of the homosexuals is aimed at the children. The young boys are so vulnerable to, to this because there's a period of time in their life, you know, when they like boys. I mean, they don't like girls. They want to stay with boys. And, uh, and if you bring in the homosexual agenda into that educational type of system, the homosexuals are going to just say, well, of course you don't like girls. Well, you're one of us. And it, it is a serious, serious matter. I mean, people don't realize that uh, we're going to lose thousands and thousands and thousands of good heterosexuals to the homosexual revolution. As a school board member, I'm extremely concerned that the homosexual activists across the United States are trying to use public schools and tax dollars to promote their agenda. What they are asking school boards across America to do is bypass the parents. I think the problem that I have with special rights legislation based on sexual preference is it takes the authority and the instruction of parents and undermines it systematically. I think that it, it shouldn't be the role of government to teach a child something else in school that is radically different than what they're learning at, at home. Uh, I'm very much behind the parents who do not think this is an appropriate kind of teaching for their children. Uh, this is not the kind of lesson we want to teach children in schools, particularly, um, I say this as former Secretary of Education, uh, when our children are last in the industrialized world in math and science, uh, the last thing we should be doing is, is fooling around with this kind of thing. Uh, they should be learning the basic skills. But on that part of the, of the school's function, where it's to teach values, it must teach the values that parents want to be taught, uh, not somebody's idea of what uh, children should learn in order to be, uh, to be enlightened. We project the voice of freedom forward beyond ourselves to the youth of today and to the generations of tomorrow. This is war, and as far as I'm concerned, there's no room for conscientious objectors. We have got to be involved in this war. Americans have to understand that this has been carefully orchestrated, it has been carefully carried out, and we are now in the stages of a lot of their agenda being brought to pass. And if the American people don't educate themselves and speak up against this issue, our children are going to be the losers. Do you understand, America, that 12% of the little boys and girls growing up today are going to be lesbians and gays, and they are not going to be called faggot and dyke and queer and sissy? We are going to save our children! The impact on the churches is going to be devastating. If a Sunday school teacher, youth director, or choir member declared they were homosexual and the church asked them to resign, the church then would have a major lawsuit on its hands. The churches who refuse to perform homosexual marriages will lose their tax exemption because they have not complied with what the court has declared to be public policy. It redefines the family. No longer do we have a family consisting of um, mother and father, children. What you're going to have now is a family consisting of anybody who wants to shack up for a while for whatever reason. I think our, our definitions of marriages, of relationships, of families really need to be expanded. We need to acknowledge on a, in a legal and social way the reality of the range of different relationships that people have in our society. Men with having relationships with men, women with women, men with women, triads, group marriages. I mean, I imagine if somebody, you know, if everybody was all okay about it, three people would be all right. Love's what okay, makes a me. family. There were some threesomes married today. Do you think that's right? 
Well, what, who's to say what's right and what's not right? I think that's what this whole thing is about. Like, what was their choice? I can't impose my values on someone else. If it's right for them, then I think that's great. This is a movement that is mobilized, that has shown, while the right wing accuses us of being anti-family, has shown that we know, uh, we know incredibly well how to build family. This is Eliza, she's two and a half. We adopted her in Minnesota. And this is Lydia, who's one, and we adopted her in China this fall. This is a family. This is a family. This is the four of us. In fact, in the inaugural parade, we had a redefinition. Uh, President Clinton included a float, Families of America, I think it was. And two of the people were two lesbians. And the whole intent was to redefine family. Obviously, homosexuality strikes at the very root of the family, is ripping apart the very definition of family, destructive to family as we know it. Yeah, you bet your life. It's a total rejection of, of the basic building block of society. Due to the media's support of the homosexual agenda, the average American has been kept from learning about the dark realities entrenched in the homosexual lifestyle. While not all homosexuals are involved in these excesses, freedom to practice all extremes without restraints are firmly incorporated into the gay political platform. To most people, when they think about homosexuals, as pictured in most of the media, it's uh, two guys, two young guys, two middle-aged guys, who simply have very deep affection for each other. They want to be partners through life, uh, help each other financially, and so on. The national media does not tell us anything about the abhorrent lifestyle of these people. The homosexuality tends to be very compulsive, whether it's at an emotional level, or an emotional and sexual, or just plain sexual level. It's very compulsive, very controlling. Um, so, like I said, it, would, it could range anywhere from mutual masturbation all the way up to defecating on one another. The ingestion of feces, that he engages in such things as anal intercourse, that he engages in such things that's known as fisting, in which one partner takes his fist and it's inserted in the anus of the other person. The ingestion of urine, urinating on one another, it's called golden showers. Um, they do rimming where they lick one another's rectums. These are things that people really don't realize are going on and it's all part of the behavior disorder that goes along with homosexuality. When I first moved to the city I was very naive about this but after a couple of years after I had seen these things happen in bathhouses and stuff it just gave me the creeps. After a while I knew this was abnormal. 23 year old men with colostomy bags, everybody in San Francisco that I knew was getting into this s and it was like a spiral funnel. I mean, everybody was, was gravitating towards this intense sex. We call it uh, playing on the edge. And so and a lot of people that doesn't appeal to, but that could be a cutting um, for scarification. Uh, it can be breath control where you actually, I mean, you have a person's life in your hands. Um, heavy whipping scenes that leave uh, permanent scars. So and that, that is a very normal extreme end of SM. We use rope, uh, we use chains, we use whips, just like the people sort of make jokes about, but we use them in ways that bring people closer together rather than move people further apart. I am into heavy play with whips, props, I like electricity. Anything that you can find in a hardware store uh, we know how to play with real well. These men that have anonymous so-called sex with hundreds and hundreds of different partners, spreading disease from one to the other, traveling across the country, we have not just a moral breakdown, but we've got a very decided health hazard. I've had so many sexual um, partners that they're without number. The um, uh, at one, one point, I know that one night I had um, at least 50 um, different partners in one night. I was more normal as opposed to an exception to the rule. 
According to the British Journal of Sexual Medicine, homosexuals are 18 times more likely than heterosexuals to have sex with an underage person. In Riverside, California, outraged parents are concerned about the well-being of their children here at this public park where homosexuals openly practice sex acts in broad daylight. The average is between 100 and 150 men a day that walk down this bike path one at a time wearing different clothing according to their sexual perversion and they walk they take the dirt paths off into the brush they meet one another and they do their sexual perversions right there in the open they're in there for an average of 15 to 20 minutes then they come out one at a time walk into the park with the children I've seen them talking with the children. I've seen them approach children. If it was a heterosexual problem, it would be taken care of and it wouldn't be permitted. However, because these are homosexuals and so many rights and privileges and ordinances, city ordinances, have been provided that protect them, all of the agencies are afraid and fearful to take any action against them. If you give homosexuals special rights in America, first of all, you've opened Pandora's box to every deviant behavior group logically being able to line up and bang on the same door and insist on special rights for themselves. You have totally destroyed, really, a realistic understanding of human rights. Uh, homosexuals today uh, should not be discriminated against in ordinary conduct and generally are not. Uh, they're entitled to the same constitutional rights of uh, free speech, uh, if anything, uh, uh, they have used uh, free speech to the point where uh, their conduct is probably offensive uh, to most people. The church, the state, hormones will decide my fate. The church, the state, hormones will decide my fate. All these groups, the sadomasochists, the pedophiles, the transsexuals, all were back marching in the gay rights parade. The gay agenda is to have sex in any way you please. We will not be able to live within this country as full human beings until we have the right to love whom we love, when we love, and where we love. And I have tremendous fears of the resulting society that will emerge if Americans, black and whites, do not stand up to this one uh, push that's being made in our country today. And the notion uh, that uh, we can be indifferent homosexuality or heterosexuality, that it's just a flip of the coin, uh, is really a, a very uh, backward notion. No society can survive, obviously, unless it uh, uh, comes full forward in favor of heterosexuality. Uh, and uh, no society in its right mind would do anything but that. That doesn't mean one is uh, 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 one bashes homosexuals or is uh, cruel or, or uh, uh, seeks to, 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 to wreak vengeance on them. Uh, what it does mean is that one is very clear about what the preferred uh, uh, style of life is. Probably the most important thing they can do is to contact their congressmen and their senators and say to their congressmen and senators, if you support the homosexual agenda, I am not only going to vote against you, I'm going to work against you. So until really there is a change in the hearts of the American people, the representatives of the American people, you know, cannot be expected to change. It's, it's totally naive and illogical of us to expect our representatives to, to force us to get moral. 20 years ago, they stated their goals. And now these goals, 20 years later, have become a reality. We are on the very verge of our civilization and our culture being totally overhauled by the homosexual agenda. You need to be that person who takes the stand, either in your school district, or in your city or county, or state, or on the national level, saying, enough is enough. I don't know what you want to call it. Call it family values, moral values, but values are very important. I think that's what made America great. And uh, this will be one further degradation of uh, our great country. And uh, we cannot allow it to happen. It's important that uh, people in America rise up and express their indignation. And, and make it clear they're not going to tolerate it. Because what is at stake uh, is the future of our, our boys and girls, but also...